Okay. Hello, folks. Sean Mice here. And uh, Richard, I know that you came to this call with a very specific question for me, and I'm going to go ahead and let you air that, and then I'm going to do my best to give you uh, my my thoughts on the topic. So go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm thinking back to a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of weeks or months ago when you did um, a call about uh, Google's updates and things, and that there's a move towards social marketing and activity. And the way that I I see it is. Um, I've actually made a video on this, but um, you know it's been a progression with uh, with Google with the content. So you know they like a good good content on your site. They like good links to your site, and increasingly they seem to be looking at activity. Now I don't quite know how they can measure all that, and you know how how definite that is, and what you think of what I've just said. But that's basically what my question is. So I'm interested in what your approach is to to social marketing now and in the future okay boy talk about a loaded question (laughs) Um, I've obviously got my own opinions on this whole thing that may or may not be grounded in any relevance or truth I I don't know I'm going to share with you okay because that's what this call is about it's about me sharing with you most of the time when I teach on this call I'm teaching from 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 solid truth from my core. I'm teaching what I know and do, what I've done for five, five and a half years now. You know, I'm, I'm teaching from, I'm teaching from reality. Okay. Today on this topic, you know, two things. Number one, I'm not an expert in this. Okay. And I'll explain, I'm going to, I'm going to go into some detail on that in just a second. Okay. I'm going to explain why. And I'm, I'm not an expert at all in that. Okay. In the whole social marketing, in the whole search engine thing. I'm not even an expert in the search engine thing, and I'll explain that in just a moment because a lot of people feel like I am. Okay. So that's number one. Number two, even if I were an expert, and even people who claim to be experts, you know, unless you're actually in the secret room in Google's headquarters where no secrets leave, okay? Um, you, 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 there's no way to, to guess the formula. And in fact, my guess is that at Google, nobody knows the formula, that, that it is sectionized. So that, you know, there's, I think there's like a thousand, I've heard a number, there's somewhere around a thousand in pieces that are implemented into the formula. My guess is those are segmented so that, that, any one person doesn't know more than what 50 of those are, okay? And that, that all of those come together in another room or on a different server, okay? They all come together, but they are codenamed so that the person that runs the coming together part doesn't know what he's looking at so, or he or she is looking at, that they only know that this input has this relevance. They don't actually know what it is. So, it, so it's leak proof. It'd be impossible for somebody to quit Google, in my opinion, and go out and share the formula with the world. Okay. Number one. Number two. It changes every day. Okay. The, my understanding is that they literally make incremental changes every day. And number two, B. The computers do a lot of that changing because it's just like if you use Website Optimizer, you can put it on, you know, something that says you know, show the best version 80% of the time but continue testing the other versions. So if you were to run Website Optimizer on your sales page and you have 10 different inputs, you wouldn't even know what today's algorithm for your sales page is. You would not know what today's algorithm is. Now, you could go in and you could study it, but 100 visitors later, the algorithm would change. Why? Because it is dynamic. And, and the search engine formula is is dynamic. Okay? And so not only do I believe that no single person has access to the entire formula, no single person could have access to the formula for more than a given period of time because the formula changes every day. Okay, now, I want to go back. We've got a lot I want to cover here. And I was really intrigued by 
you know, by the question you're going to ask, I said, wow, I'm glad somebody's going to ask this today because I just love it when I can get into theoretical stuff like this. You just heard me a few minutes ago in a totally non-theoretical arena, except it was a hypothetical scenario I created. But, you know, it's it's what I do and many other marketers do. So this is fun for me. and I enjoy this, Richard. Okay, so let's go back to me, and we'll come back to the formula in a few minutes, okay? We're kind of jumping around. I don't know a linear way to do this. So for right-brained people, um, this is probably a an exciting thing because you're so used to me being so left-brained, very logical and linear, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to be right-brained here for a few minutes. And we're going to kind of jump back and say, you know, what about me? Okay, there's two questions about me. Number one, what, you're not an SEO expert. And then the next, the, the second thing about me is, um, you know, hey, why not? Okay, so the first, the first thing is, no, I'm not an SEO expert, and sometimes I'm attributed some SEO um, 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 strengths simply because of the fact that of my success with article marketing. Okay, but I want to be very clear that anything I've ever done with article marketing, the exception of some dabbling here and there, it has just always been for the purpose. The bulk of it has always been for the purpose of generating direct traffic from the articles. And anything that happens from SEO in, is, in my opinion, it's just incidental. Okay, now, having established that, you know, where does the SEO happen? Why, did, why do rankings happen when we do article marketing? Well, it's not because of the articles per se. It's simply because, hey, the articles kind of fit into the formula that the search engines like of content plus links. Okay, so just the act of doing article marketing creates an SEO impact. It creates links, it creates targeted links, it creates targeted content-oriented links. I mean, hey, it's like the perfect recipe for good SEO rankings. It really is. And, and what I've pretty much always taught is, look, do the article marketing and don't worry about the SEO and the traffic will come and who cares where it comes from. Okay, now. Well, I suppose, I suppose, Sean, that you're you're talking about the three things I mentioned there. You know, an article on these on articles is content, it's links, and it's activity, isn't it? Well, if it's placed on a on a on a directory that does some job, does a good job of getting people to view it. Well, yeah, they, they've got it's 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 like it's the perfect recipe. It's like it's exactly what the search engines are looking for. And you don't have to game the system. You, you see, the, the problem that I have with SEO across the board is that, you, you see, it's this war, okay? Google and the other search engines, their strongest desire is to maximize the, 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 the searcher experience. Okay, now you might say, well, their, their strongest goal is to monetize the, 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 the searcher experience, okay? And that's their ultimate goal with their business, okay? But their actual goal with the search engine results is to maximize the searcher experience because if they maximize the searcher experience, more people come to that search engine versus another, then they can monetize it. If they don't get the algorithm right, then marketing doesn't matter monetization doesn't matter. None of it matters. If people go searching and don't get relevant results, then nothing else matters, okay? You know, it's kind of like you have an auto repair shop, okay? You know, is, is the guy in business or girl, is the guy or girl in business to do a really good job of repairing cars, or is he or she in business to make a living? Well, hopefully it's both, okay? Hopefully it's both because if it was just because he likes to do charity work on cars, I probably wouldn't open up a shop for that. He'd do that at night. If it was just to make money, then he wouldn't be fixing the cars right. Nobody would ever come back. You have to have both. They're both just as important. That's what's going on on the search engine. So one of the things that's really, really, really important is maximizing the customer experience. How do we do that? Well, we get the right pages to come up, the right relevance to come up. Okay. When somebody makes a search, so on the other side of this war is everybody that has a website that's not on page one, okay, 
they're saying, okay, well, I think my page should be on page one. Okay, my website should be on page one of these rankings. So the first question is, does it belong there? I mean, does, does, is your web page really better than all the other two million that have the same keyword as yours? Is it really bad? But likely it's not. I mean, it has a one in two million chance of actually being better. Okay, now, once you've asserted that indeed it is a truth, that your website is better than the other two million that are competing for the top ten spaces. Once you've ascertained that, then you say in your mind, you say, okay, if this is the case, what can I do to get Google to award me one of those top ten spots? Okay, now, if Google's formula is correct, and if we had a perfect world where nobody was trying to gain the system, their formula would 100% of the time perfectly award the person who has absolutely the best web page. Okay. However, because we've got 2 million people, or whatever the number is for any given keyword, vying for those top 10 spots, many people, maybe most people, okay, are trying to do things to game the system to trick Google into giving them a ranking they don't deserve. Does that make sense? Perfect sense, yeah. yeah. I mean, think about it. That's what it all is. It is a war, an all-out war, between Google attempting to serve good customer-relevant pages and people wanting to get their web page in a slot they don't deserve. Because if they really deserved it, and if other people weren't trying to game the system, they'd have to slot, they'd have to do no work at all. Okay, now what I have observed over the last five and a half years as I've been in this business, what I have observed is every few months, people become better and better at gaming a certain part of Google's system, and they get high rankings, then every few months, Google realizes what they've done to gain it, and in the true spirit of war, they shut down whatever it is that the offender has done. Okay, now, I'm going to take what to many will seem like a small-minded view of the whole SEO thing, but it's mine. And it's pretty much been mine for the last five and a half years, okay, with the exception of some caveats. I throw some money at the SEO equation from time to time. I throw some links at the SEO equation from time to time, but 95% or 98% of all my effort is not on SEO. It's on effective email marketing. It's on real traffic generation like article marketing. It's on solo ads and joint ventures and ad swaps and all of the things I've done for years. 95 to 98% of my effort, only maybe 2% is put into search engines. And before I give you my small-minded view, okay, I also want to say this, that as I look back over the last five years and I add up in my mind all of the money that I have invested in SEO, and I compare the return on my investment in SEO, with my return on investment on anything else that I've done, if I had taken all of the money I've invested in SEO and buried it in my backyard and forgotten about it, I'd probably be better off today. Okay, now you can go anywhere you want with that, okay? Including the place that says, you know what, it's one of the things I dabble in that I'm not an expert at. Let me repeat that. It's one of the things I dabble in that I'm not an expert at. And I also believe it's not possible to be an expert in all things. And we have to pick and choose our battles. Okay? And there's some things I'm very, very good at online, and when I do those things, I make more money than when I specialize in things I don't know anything about. Okay? So now let me give you my small-minded opinion. My small-minded opinion is 
that unless you're going to genuinely become an SEO expert or put the money into hiring an SEO expert, and unless you are going to genuinely count on generating the bulk of your profits from SEO or from traffic derived from search engine results, that dabbling in SEO is probably a waste of time and money. Okay, now, it's my opinion, so it can't be right or wrong. Many people will vehemently disagree with it. Obviously, people in companies who have nice search engine rankings, whether legitimately or not, and are monetizing those search engine rankings, okay, then obviously to those individuals, there is a revenue stream, whether it's a windfall, whether it's luck, whether it's coincidence, or whether it's the result of hard work, even if it is the result of hard work, but only one in a hundred people or one in a thousand people who do the hard work actually get the result, then for someone who does not already have results, is it a good gamble? I believe it's not. I, this is my opinion, Richard. I genuinely believe that somebody that's starting out in business today online should focus on finding dependable lead sources that are consistent month in and month out and are not dependent on the whims of other people or other companies. Please don't get me wrong. Search engine traffic is really cool. It's really cool. You know, hey, it comes in like clockwork for three or four months. It's really cool. But what happens in month five when the algorithm changes? And you've got an organization set up. You've got payroll. If you're a small entrepreneur, you've got a mortgage to pay and mouths to feed. And you've built your business on the whims and algorithms of other people and other companies. No matter how wonderful it is today, no matter how wonderful it is today, I'm building a business for the future. I must build a business for the future. Because if I build my business on the whims of other people and other companies, the whims of other people and other companies, sure, to make some extra money today, yes. Can I make enough extra money that it makes me really excited that I say, you know what, I go out and buy a flashy, brand new, shiny car and put a, a payment on it? Okay, because, hey, I have the money coming in today. I know I can make that payment. And then what happens when it all falls apart? We hear these stories over and over and over again. We call people unlucky when they go bankrupt. We call people unlucky when business falls off. We blame the economy. We blame the president. We blame the prime minister. We blame the economic chief, whatever they call him in your country or mine. Okay? We blame the stock market. We blame the interest rate. But... The bottom line is, if we're building our business on something we cannot control, I believe that we're making a mistake. Okay, so the corollary to this is, let's find some traffic. It might cost us a little more than free search engine traffic, although I don't believe tra search engine traffic is actually free because there's a time involved in making it happen. Therefore, it's not free. Okay? And there's usually money associated with making it happen, even though, I mean, each individual click marginally is free. It took an awful lot of fixed costs to get us there. Okay? My opinion is, put your time and money into traffic sources that can be controlled by you. Okay? Meaning that, and by the way, I'm going to include pay-per-click which is the paid side of SEO, I'm going to include a pay-per-click here. Okay, now I'm not an expert at pay-per-click, and therefore I generally lose money if I do a pay-per-click campaign. Okay, however, there's plenty of people that make money on it. Um, pay-per-click, just like just about any other traffic source, requires extensive testing and requires a budget to make that testing occur. Okay, however, I'm going to include that as I make this discussion now because I believe that it is something that's quantifiable. It is something that you do have some relative control over, 
obviously we go right back to the to the issue with if we specifically say Google, we go back to the fact that they have been known over the years to change their algorithm for paid results and and that's wreaked havoc with many people. In fact, I, I've, I've seen headlines and heard of stories where, where people's entire business was, from what I heard, basically wiped out because of that algorithmic change. I don't know how true or not true those kinds of things are. However, I mean, again, you're, you're, if all of your eggs are in one basket with pay-per-click traffic, for example, then you know, maybe that's part of the problem. Okay, so what if we were to put our money into traffic sources that we had more control over? Okay, so let's, let's list, we'll list five or six, okay? Pay-per-click is going to be one. Cost per action is going to be another, okay? And I'm not an expert, so I can't even point you in the right direction there, okay? But, I mean, that's the idea of paying people a certain a dollar amount for creating a, a lead for you, okay? So... A um, little bit different than pay-per-click. Pay-per-click, you're paying for the click. Cost per action, you're paying for the sale or, or paying for the subscriber. Okay, So another place would be affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing where you are selling the product. It's your product, not your selling product. Other people are selling your product, and they're selling it only to break even for you, Okay meaning that you are not trying to make money on other people selling your affiliate products. You're just looking for the leads. So you have a $25 product that other people sell. Other people sell a 1,000 of those a month. You make 1,000 sales. You have a 1,000 buyer subscribers come into your campaign. You paid out $25,000 in affiliate commissions. You got paid $25,000 in revenue. It costs you nothing to generate a 1,000 buyer subscribers. It could even be argued that even if you were paying the equivalent of $35 for every $25 sale, as long as you were monetizing the buyer leads, then if, if you're paying, if you're making an investment of, let's say, $10 per buyer, and as long as you're monetizing it appropriately and generating, say, $100 per buyer, then even in that scenario, even if you're paying for those buyer subscribers, then you're still in a profitable scenario, okay? Um, email advertising, um, where you, you rent access to somebody else's list. They maintain it, they keep it, they grow it, and you mail it for a fee. Email advertising. It used to be called, I think, e-zine advertising when I first got started online, called it e-zine advertising, and, and you, you, you know, you pay so much to send a blast out to somebody else's list. Those things became less and less popular because with the spam laws, it became more difficult for those big companies to aggregate big massive lists of emails and mail them legally. Okay, and so what we've seen is we've seen kind of a morphing into something we now call solo ad mailing. It's basically the exact same thing as easy mailing and, and email mailing or email um, email mail. Okay. The whole idea here is that you're mailing to somebody else's list. Okay. Now, the beautiful thing is it applies to email marketing is that these, if those subscribers are targeted, then we know that they're people who open up email. One of the big problems with pay per click or search engines is that the the, the demographics of people who use search engines to get information are sometimes different than the demographics of people who use email as their, their, one of their primary ways to make a buying decision. Okay, and so if, if you're building a list of pay-per-click clickers, they're not going to be as responsive as, as email clickers. Okay, so let's move into another category, and this is going to be the content category, but we're going to differentiate it from SEO. Okay, and that's going to be the content, which is articles or blog submissions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now, you may ask, how does this differ from search engine optimization? And here's why. Because with search engine optimization, you're optimizing for one company, Google. You may be optimizing for Bing or Yahoo or something like that, but, but, but what we hear most of the time is people are optimizing for Google. I think that'd probably be a fair statement in today's world. 
people are optimizing for Google. If you're submitting content to the content networks, whether they're articles or blog posts, et cetera, et cetera, you're not targeting Google. You're targeting all places that get content clicks. Some of those are through Google, some through Yahoo, some through Bing, some through the directories themselves, some through um, other people linking to the content because it's good. And so what happens is you create this vast network of content. And if Google were to either go out of business today or ban all content, okay, which is highly unlikely because, hey, that's half their formula, okay, then you'd still only lose a percentage of your total traffic because of the fact that you're hooked into a network of content. You see, that's what the Internet is. It's a network of content. Okay, now some people might look at Google and say, hey, they've monopolized the content online. I beg to differ. And if you look at, at the actual number of daily clicks to through Google compared to total daily clicks all over the world, I think you're going to find that it's a very, very, very small number. And if Google were to go out of business tomorrow, the clicks would continue to happen. They just wouldn't be facilitated by Google. Okay, Google does not dictate that when searchers are looking for information, they go online. They happen to be where people tend to go when they want to type something into a search box. Okay, but Google does not control the bulk of all content network around. Okay, you know, think about this. If, if you want generic information, if your wife has a question for you about something, you want a quick answer, you turn on the computer and you might go to Google and you get one. Okay? You may or may not buy anything. But let's just say that you have a serious question about, uh, let's just say copywriting, and you think, how am I going to learn some serious stuff about copywriting? You might go to Google and you might find that the first top ten results are pretty irrelevant for what you're trying to figure out, that it's just basic information that's been monopolized by people who have used um, the tricky SEO techniques to try to get the content to show up in the top 10 spots. And you look at it and you go, this isn't really what I need. What I really need is probably buried on page 2050, and I don't care to, to dig till I get to it. So what do you do? You go, okay, well, who do I know who knows people who copyright, and you send them an email, and you say, hey, hey, you, you know anybody that knows anything about copywriting, and they send you a couple of names, okay, and maybe some websites to go to. And so you go to those websites, and you read through their websites, and you see they've got good information, and then on their website, to the right-hand side or the left-hand side of their website, there's a list of links that says recommended copywriting training, and you click on those links and you read through some of the various, what are you doing? You're reading through content, and Google didn't have anything to do with it. Okay, now, where are you more likely to buy? Are you more likely to buy on the top ten results in Google? Or are you more likely to, to buy when you've sent somebody an email and they sent you some links and you spent some time on the websites and you went to some recommended links and you read some content there and you clicked on some more recommended links? My friend, I believe that's where the buying occurs. And if you can dominate that market, if you can dominate the genuine content network, by positioning yourself as an expert online and letting other people know about it, that's how you get relevant buying content traffic. Okay, now where does Google come in? Well, if you do a good job of what I just shared with you, then you're going to line up with Google's formula. Why? Because you're putting good content out there, you're not gaming their system, you're getting good relevant organic traffic. Why is it organic and relevant? Well, because you're positioned as an expert when somebody comes to you to, to, to somebody else asking for help, they think of your name, they send them to your website. From your website, they go somewhere else, they get some content, they see your name somewhere else, and, and they buy. And Google sees that activity, and then if they choose to, if somebody else doesn't game you out of the position, hey, 
maybe you also get some Google traffic. My point is you don't focus on the search engine traffic. You focus on being a good provider of content. You focus on plugging that content into a network of humans because computers don't buy, humans do. You plug that content into a network of humans, okay, and there is where you're going to get consistent traffic, okay? So we could go on and on about other traffic sources. I've hit on a few of the big ones. You know, the pay-per-click CPA, that's the fastest way to just buy yourself traffic. It's probably the least targeted of anything I've just shared with you. A content network, you build a content network with articles and blog posts, both yours and other people's, guest blogging, guest, guest article writing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to build solid, solid traffic over time, but it doesn't happen right away. Okay, You want traffic right away, then you go down the solo advertising route. You get traffic right away. It's targeted traffic, obviously, because you're paying for it money and not time. You've got to monetize it fairly fairly quickly. Richard, does, does, does that give you some insight into how I feel on this whole SEO uh, traffic content sticky question? Yeah, it's very interesting, um, Sean. You've gone slightly, at a slightly different way than I expected uh, naturally. And, uh, yeah, it's very exciting, really. I mean, I think that's very interesting, the... Um, if you can genuinely dominate the content in your niche, then basically you've got it made. I mean, that's basically true, isn't it, what you're saying there? It doesn't matter what Google does. Well, I want to be very careful with saying you've got it made, okay, because... Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, not, I'm just um, I'm, I'm putting it in a lack of... Made. But, but yeah. I personally, personally, I just believe that focusing on generating good content and, and dom positioning yourself as an expert, however you do it, but positioning yourself, I mean, you know, I've got, I think I've got hours of training on how to position yourself as an expert, okay, so to yeah. be able to describe all of it in five minutes. You know, if, if, if someone were to genuinely position themselves as an expert and produce content that matches up with that, that, with that expectation, and they were to forget about the search engines, my belief is they would get more stable traffic over time. Because in my opinion, we, are, we should be building businesses for the future, not for a one-time cash windfall today. We're not right. building a gambling business. We're not building a lottery <laughs> business. We are building a real business, okay? And if you're building a real business, you, you want your traffic to, to come from reliable sources, sources you can control, and or sources that will stand the test of time. Sources that are not dependent on Google or MSN or Bing or Yahoo or Easy Articles or anywhere else. You know, even if you look at the work I've done with eZine Articles, eZine Articles isn't the only place that those articles exist because other people have come and taken my articles and syndicated them and put them on their website, and I get traffic from other people's websites. So even in my case with eZine Articles, it, it is simply a conduit. It is simply a pipe in the system. It's simply an easy way for me to disseminate the information. It's not necessary. It is, for me, it was just a really easy way. Okay? The, the, and, and please don't get me wrong. I, I get a lot of traffic from using articles. Okay? However, it's critical that the, biz, the entire business itself is not dependent on one link. It's not, my business is not dependent on easy articles. It's not dependent on Google or Yahoo or Bing or MSN. It's not dependent on any one individual. It's not dependent, it, there's, there, it's not dependent on any one person, two people, three people. They, the, the traffic is diversified enough. 
that if certain organizations were to go out of business or ban me or decide they didn't like me or change their algorithm, that if my business is affected, maybe it's 5% or 10%. Well, what's 5% or 10%? You just beef things up somewhere else. That's as opposed to having your entire strategy focused on one particular company that's sending you lead to your traffic. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I suppose um, putting it a little bit more um, coolly than I did earlier, it's really you're, you're talking about if you are genuinely an expert in your niche and you produce content for that niche based on your expertise, you are going to get activity. And Google likes that. You're absolutely right. Google, Google likes that. And, and here's the thing. I genuinely believe nobody wants to hear this, okay? And, and so, well, nobody, I mean, that's another strong word. I hate always or never, nobody or everybody when it's talking about this business because there's always a caveat. But, but the thing is, what I'm getting ready to say doesn't sell really well. And so you don't say it a lot. I mean, you're in the business that I'm in. You know, if a particular topic sells really well, you twitch on it more. Okay, just because something doesn't sell well doesn't mean that it that it's not relevant. Okay, but you know, one of the things, one of the strongest ways I believe to build a business, and if you followed me for a long time, you've seen an undercurrent of this. Okay, it's to focus on being the expert. It's to focus on positioning yourself as an expert and allow people to be drawn to you. Okay, now the problem with saying that is that, you know, people go out there and they'll position themselves as an expert, but they won't do any work to do the drawing, well, then nothing happens, okay? But if, if you genuinely go out there and position yourself as an expert and then go to all the other experts in your niche and, and you say, hey, you know, could we do a little joint venture together, you know, where I'll, I'll help you out, you'll help me out, we'll do something together, we'll do a teleseminar together, we'll build a list together, or whatever, and you do that with 10 other people or 20 other people, you get access to everybody else that's in the niche. Guess what? Your level of expertise is going to begin to shine through. Okay, if you position yourself, even if it's on Google, so whether it's Google or easy, anywhere, if as a part of your strategy, you position yourself so that you show up as looking like an expert, okay, then that's going to add to the whole thing. So, for example, in easing articles, one piece of the puzzle could be to have the most articles in a particular category. And, and when people look at that category page, they're going to see your name come up first. What does that say? It screams expert, okay? What happens if, okay, so here's a different tactic with Google. Now, please understand, this is totally different than what we've been talking about, okay, because what we've been talking about is whether we've defined it or not. We've talked about people searching for an answer or a keyword and coming up with you, okay. What, what we can do very effectively on Google, and we can do it in Google and Yahoo and Bing and everywhere else, is for our name, if somebody Googles our name, we look like an expert, okay. And what happens is so many people work so hard to build up their whole content network and they do all of these things. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but I Google people's names sometimes. Sometimes, okay? I believe other people do too, okay? And if they Google your name and they come up with your Facebook page with pictures of your kids playing and then they come up with um, an Orkut page with something else on it, and then they come up with some resume you posted 10 years ago, and they come up with some of your tweets that you did to some of your friends on Friday night, and, and if those are the kinds of things that are coming up in Google under your name, you're killing your expertise, your position of expertise. An easy thing to do is to go in and ask yourself, for my name, what do I want the top 10 pages in Google to be? Okay, and then do a few things to, to help Google see that those pages belong to rank. Because remember, unless your name is the same as a famous basketball player, or football player, or princess, or queen, okay, or president, or prime minister, the, the odds of your name being very competitive are, 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 are very, very small, okay? And, and so it's very easy to just create pages 
that are specifically geared to being able to show up for your name in Google. And we're totally disconnecting this from people searching on a keyword and finding you. I'm just saying, hey, if they look for you on Google, it should be a professional appearance. If you have a Facebook account and you want people to see you as an expert, maybe you don't need to post pictures and a running account of what's going on in your family and church life and children and husband and wife on your Facebook. And then you may say, well, it's my moral and ethical right to be able to have a Facebook account and do whatever I want with it. Well, yeah, but do you want to be positioned as an expert online? Then you need to, everything needs to line up. The same thing with your Twitter account. You, you know, with, with, with all the others, with LinkedIn, with everything else. I don't believe it matters if you don't participate in all those things, but if you do participate and people are able to find those pages, it's got to line up with your expert, your expertness. Because if you do 99 things right, but people see one thing inconsistent, they'll write off everything else they know about you. They'll just write it all off and they'll say that person is a sham. Okay, and, and so, you know, kind of a side note here, that's one, that's one more area that you can position yourself as an expert. And so I believe that you, you need, you want to have a balanced approach to positioning yourself as an expert in your niche. And if you do a balanced approach and you get other people to talk about you and you create content that other people will want to talk about, okay, then you can create a real business. Now, why is this not popular? Huh. The biggest reason it's not popular is because it's very hard to quantify and because you can't promise somebody they'll get rich next month. Okay, I mean, one of the biggest lies I see online is that all you have to do is do these few steps right here and you'll be rich in a month. Okay, you know, my, my 27 year old cousin who was broke and living under a bridge, you know, he did these particular things and 30 days later he was an internet millionaire. You know, that, that's, it's, that, it's, it's all hogwash. It, it's, it, it's not true. It's a storyline that sells really well and so people use it. But it's not true. It takes time to build an internet business. Unfortunately, people don't want to hear that. <laughs> they don't want to hear that. They, you know, if you present them an option to build a business and take two years building a real solid business that will provide for the rest of their life or to make a gamble that they might be able to do it in 30 days, 99 out of 100 times, I, 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 my guess is it's 98 or 99 out of 100 times, people will choose the gamble. And next month, they'll choose another gamble. Next month, they'll choose another gamble. You know, the truth of the matter is you've been around long enough to know it doesn't work that way. And that building a real solid business over time where people trust and believe in you, that's the way that's the way to do it, to build a solid business over time. And obviously, then you've got the monetization piece. We're just talking about the promotional piece. We're talking about positioning yourself so that when people think of your topic, they think about calling you and no one else. Any other thoughts or questions, Richard? No, I can't, I can't think of anything. Well, actually, um, what about... Um Getting involved with with social marketing like like Twitter and that kind of thing. Okay, I'm going to give you my my disclaimer here, and that is to say that I'm not an expert at, at social marketing, and um, I, I don't do any social marketing, and and so I'm really the wrong person to talk about this at all. Okay, but because you asked, okay. because you're paying to be here in my coaching program, and because you asked, I'll share my thoughts on this. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to make this short, maybe two minutes. Okay, I'm going to make a statement that will not be popular, but that's okay. I believe it to be true. Only a very small percentage of people monetize effectively their social media, their social marketing work. Okay, M meaning that it's just like anything else. Okay, meaning that if you've got a hundred people that try to do some social marketing to improve the revenue in their business, only one of them actually improves the revenue. So you, you could have 100 people spending 20 hours a week doing all the right things, but if they don't know how to turn that into revenue, then it's pretty wasted. 
Okay, now, what happens is some of the social media experts, they point to the one person who's done it and done it right, and they say, okay, all you've got to do is social media. Well, I don't believe that's true. You've got to do something very specific. And here's what I believe there's two specific things that you can do in social media. Okay, I'm not an expert on it. I'm not going to go into detail on how to do it. There's plenty of good training material out there that, 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 that someone could wade through and learn it if that's what they wanted to do. I believe social media is good for two things. Number one is lead generation. Number one is lead generation, okay? What I mean by that is creating an organization, using Facebook and, and Twitter and all of those other things as part of a content network like I've already described and taught. Simply using it as part of the network and then setting it, setting up within the network opportunities for people to download a free gift. They go to a squeeze page and they become a lead. Okay. I believe that's one place that social media can be useful. The problem is that most people who get involved in social media think that social media means sitting there and chit-chatting for 20 hours of the week, building relationships with people that they don't even have as leads. They think of their fan book page on, on, on Facebook, their fan page on Facebook, as being a set of leads. I don't believe that they are. Because as soon as you begin to try to market to that set of leads, all of a sudden, they all ban you and you can't talk to them anymore. Okay? And, and maybe that's an exaggeration, but the idea is there that what you've got to do is you've got to segment those people out, get the profitable, get the responsive people onto an email list, and communicate with them via email, not Facebook. Okay? That's the first place where social media can be effective and where it's usually done wrong, in my opinion. The second place where it can be effective is for an established organization. Okay? Probably not an information company, unless you're established and you have 50 employees or whatever. Okay? So you, you've got a big organization. Okay? Think washing machine company. Think car company. Okay? Think big company that tends to have customer service issues. Okay? A really, really easy way to cut back on your number of customer service phone calls is to direct people to your social media place where you've hired some social media people to sit there and monitor all the complaints and then help people out. Now, that really cuts down on your telemarketing expenses if you can get a percentage of people to post to do their complaints through a content network and then solve their complaint and, and help fix it and even take that information and use it as intelligence to create future, future possibilities. And then one more way, we could call this 2B, another place where I think social media is really valuable, is if, you, again, you've got a big organization. You could even do this as a small organization. Okay? If, you, if you go in and, and monitor Twitter feeds or Facebook pages who, who are, are, are expressing a need for something that you present, okay? so you, you teach on a specific thing and you monitor Twitter feeds or you monitor Facebook feeds, and somebody has just tweeted about something that you can help them with, and within five minutes they've tweeted it to their to someone, their friend. They've said, "Hey, I'm trying to figure this out. If you can intervene and say, "Hey, I can help you with that," and you help them with it, you've created a relationship." Now that's very difficult for an entrepreneur to do. That's very difficult to do if you don't have an organization behind you to make it happen. And because the results from it are very marginal and very incremental, it, 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 it's, it's pretty difficult for an entrepreneur to feel like it's worth their time. Okay, so generally you're only seeing some of the bigger companies do that kind of thing. So those are the two or three scenarios where I think that social media is, can be very, very powerful. Unfortunately, when, when the, the human entrepreneur, okay, goes in and says, okay, I'm going to do one of those three things on, on the social media platforms. I'm going to do that. They get distracted and they lose their focus and they don't just do one of those things. They also try to do all the things that other people are doing and when that happens, social media falls flat and doesn't produce sales. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense, uh, Sean, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up this discussion. Um, I, I obviously am 
you know, I was like I said on on ex on positioning yourself as an expert. You know, I've I've got a, a pretty decent sized training that goes deep into detail on making that happen. Today, really, just trying to answer your question about social media and social marketing and SEO and that kind of thing, and and just trying to give you some honest feedback on my opinion of all of it. And uh, I trust that that I have indeed that I have indeed uh, done that. 